Welcome to eBible Fellowship's Sunday Bible Study. For broadcast times in your area of these studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now it's time to begin our Sunday study with your speaker, Chris McCann. Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship Sunday Afternoon Bible Study. Today will be study number 8 of Daniel chapter 1. And we're going to read from Daniel 1 beginning in verse 6. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. And I'll stop reading there. In our last study, we were looking at um, the names of Daniel and his three friends, and we saw the, the meaning. Uh, each, each one of their names has meaning that identifies and relates to God, which we would expect for the people of God that were born Jews and, and had identification with uh, the, the kingdom of heaven. But here in Babylon, the prince of the eunuchs gave them names that were Babylonian names, and these names we saw identify with Babylonian gods. And it, it's all a part of Satan's attempt, because Satan is typified by the king of Babylon. It's all part of Satan's attempt to receive worship as God. The, these Jews or uh, people of God, they came from Judah, which is the representation of God's kingdom on earth, and he took them away from Judah, and now he's taken their names. He, he um, is giving them names that identify with Babylon and identify with Babylonian gods, and therefore Satan is seeking to receive the adulation, the worship from these these young men who have been faithful. They have been faithful to their God. And despite the circumstances and, and despite the, the fact that they have been taken into captivity, yet God uh, refers to those that went into captivity as good figs. They, they are those that the Lord would uh, identify as being faithful. Well, uh, we wonder about the prince of the eunuchs, 
who gave them the names, the Babylonian names, and and he would have been under orders, uh, having instructions from the king. All, all this is coming forth from the king of Babylon. Yet there is this prince of the eunuchs that Daniel and and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego find themselves under. The prince of the eunuchs has authority over them. And, well, well, actually, uh, it's a little cloudy concerning who the, this prince of the eunuchs is or, or who actually um, has the authority over them. What I mean is if we go back to verse 3 of Daniel 1, it says, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed and of the princes. Well, there we read of Ashpenaz, the master of the king's eunuchs. And that's the last time we read about him, as, as far as the name Ashpenaz or even the the reference to master of the eunuchs beginning in verse 7 and and through verse 10 we read of the prince of the eunuchs several times um, actually in verse 7 the prince of the eunuchs is mentioned once in verse 8 he's mentioned in verse 9 and 10 and 11 Five times the prince of the eunuch is referred to. He's referred to one more time a little later on uh, in, in one of the later verses after this particular situation passes concerning the proving of the young Hebrews uh, with their diet. And, and so we find he is mention these five times in verses 7 through 11. But also in verse 11, it says, Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel. And, and so there's this third individual, or it seems to be a third individual, named Melzar. And Melzar is also the one in verse 16 that took away the portion of their meat. And, and so we have Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs. Then we have an unnamed prince of the eunuchs. Thirdly, there is Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs set up over Daniel and his friends. And so... It's a little bit difficult to see who is who is Daniel dealing with. Well, we we find that that it was the prince of the eunuchs in verse ten that said to Daniel, "I fear my lord the king," and 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 so forth. It, um, if I uh, remove the food that he has appointed you, and in response to the prince of the eunuchs, verse eleven, then Daniel. Then said Daniel to Melzar, prove thy servants these ten days. And it's, it's uh, difficult um, trying to determine who is being addressed. But it, it appears that Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, um, could be the one that is ultimately in charge of uh, of the eunuchs, um, and, and I'm saying appears because this isn't sure at all, but Ashpenaz could be the one who uh, sort of gets it all going, he gets it started, he brings the eunuchs into their training academy, and then while in the training academy, there is a prince of the eunuchs who is unnamed, and, and Daniel um, is dealing with the prince of the eunuchs, but since the prince of the eunuchs has set up Melzar, any dealings with Melzar 
would also be considered dealings with the Prince of the Eunuchs. That, that might be how this is working here. Although, again, I, I don't think that's uh, definite at all. But uh, that's um, the best I can figure out about it. Well, let's think about the Prince of the Eunuchs. He's the one that's mentioned five times in these four verses. And he's the one who is uh, said to allow Daniel to be proven and, and so forth for the 10 days. And let's ask the question, who does the prince of the eunuchs represent? Who is he a type and a figure of? Well, first of all, he's the prince of the eunuchs. So he's the prince over eunuchs. And we looked a, a while back at what eunuchs represent, and we saw that they represent uh, God's elect. Remember in Matthew chapter 19, it said in verse 10 through 12, his disciples say unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs that were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Eunuchs that have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. So a eunuch in service to God, the kingdom of heaven. Also, uh, in Isaiah 56 beginning in verse 3. Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to Jehovah speak, saying, Jehovah hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith Jehovah unto the eunuchs, that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant, even unto them... Will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters? I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. So eunuchs receive an everlasting name. And whenever we read of that kind of language uh, of uh, eternity, an everlasting name, it uh, definitely is referring to salvation and eternal life. So eunuchs are pictures of God's elect, and especially Daniel and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, I'm more familiar with their Babylonian names than their Hebrew names of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel and his three friends, they are without any question uh, saved individuals. They are God's elect, and they are also eunuchs because they've been set uh, in, in a place where they're under the authority of the prince of the eunuchs. And, uh, and that makes them eunuchs. They have been made eunuchs by men, but they're, they're also servants of God. And and, and so the prince of the eunuchs is the prince over these true believers. He's a prince over God's elect. Now, if we look at the word prince, this word is translated several different ways, but it's also translated as prince in a few important places. In Isaiah chapter 9... And verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And obviously that's a reference to the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. 
in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 8, it says in verse 11, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and, and so forth. And that's referring to Satan's assault against Christ, the prince of the host. In verse 25 of Daniel 8, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hands, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Another reference to uh, Jesus Christ. In Daniel 10.13, it says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. And Michael is another name for Christ. The name Michael means who is assuredly who is God. And he is one of the chief princes because of the Trinity. And, and each a person of the Trinity is of equal power and authority. So each is a prince. Michael, the Lord Jesus, is one of the princes. Uh, also in verse 21 of Daniel chapter 10, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. And uh, he's also called uh, Michael the prince in Daniel 12, verse 1. Now in the New Testament, just to be very clear about this, so there's no mistake who the prince is it says in Acts chapter 5 verse 31 him and verse 30 is mentioning Jesus him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins Jesus is prince one last verse Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the eunuchs. No, it doesn't say that there. It says, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. But who are the kings of the earth? The kings of the earth are God's elect, true believers. Just as eunuchs typify God's elect and true believers. So, prince of the kings of the earth or prince of the eunuchs. They're uh, spiritually the same thing. So, here we have a prince of the eunuchs. And yes, uh, it, it, it's Babylon. And yes, the king of Babylon is an evil king. And the prince of the eunuchs is under this evil king of Babylon. I know that, but keep in mind that God is able to use um, unsaved kings or um, kings of heathen nations, um, or, or let's put it this way, the people of God are found to serve at times in the Bible uh, heathen kings. I'm not saying that Historically, the prince of the eunuchs was a, was a child of God. He, in all probability, was not. He's just some man that uh, could have been taken from another nation, or maybe he is a Babylonian, I'm not sure. But who he represents is the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as uh, Joseph was lifted up out of the dungeon in, in Egypt, and came to be the the right hand power of Pharaoh, and 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 we would think Egypt and Pharaoh typically. What what does that have to do with the Lord Jesus Christ? And yet Joseph is a type and a figure of Christ, 
as he comes to rule um, second in command under Pharaoh. And, and I don't always know why God uh, draws these kinds of spiritual pictures, but he does draw them from time to time. Well, let's return here to Daniel 1 and look at verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And, and Daniel purposed in his heart. And it's uh, telling that it's referring to Daniel's heart because Daniel is someone who has a new heart and a new spirit. God has saved him. And it's in that new heart that God uh, has, has given perfection. And there is no sin of any kind, but there is an ongoing desire to do the will of God. And God's will is, is very um, straightforward when it comes to meats, as he instructed the Jews of old, these are the meats you are to eat. And these are the meats you are not to eat. Likewise, God said it's not for kings to drink wine, it, uh, nor strong drink. And, and now Daniel is being confronted with a diet of meat and drink that goes against the will of God. It goes against the commandments of God. And, and therefore, it goes against that desire that God has placed in his heart to uh, do his will and to keep his commandments. And, and this is a grievous thing for the child of God. It's a very troubling thing. You know, all down through history, uh, God's people have found themselves on occasion in, uh, and it normally happens in the life of practically every child of God. There, of course, are some that, that um, children of God, those that God saved, that died as an infant, and they didn't experience this type of thing. But if you live any length of time at all in the world, uh, uh, you find, as a child of God, that there will come situations where we are put to the test. And, and the test will be uh, regarding the word of God and what God has said concerning some point. Now, as far as Satan's concerned, he doesn't care which point of the Bible it is. And it, it's just from Satan's perspective, whatever point that he is pressing upon the child of God. He simply desires for the child of God to submit to him, to disobey God, just as he did back in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the, the point happened to be the tree and God's command, thou shall not eat of this one particular tree. And, and so Satan came pressing Adam and Eve on that point. That happened to be the only uh, law of God, and, and it was the only point he could um, seek to usurp the authority of God on, but that's how he works. He will come on a particular point, and normally it's circumstances. People are different, our life um, experiences are different. Our circumstances are different. With some people, they might be self-employed. And with others, they, they have a job and, and a family, and they need the wages for that job. And, and so uh, it, it's much more trying for that child of God who works under 
um, uh, <laughs> prince of the eunuchs, or he, he works in a business, in a corporation that has um, a power structure, an authority structure, and over the course of the Great Tribulation and into this Day of Judgment, the law of God has been uh, dismissed. It's not regarded in, in any serious way. And so they have made changes in the, the way they do things. And one of the big changes is they just look at Sunday as another profit-making day. Another day to do business to make more money. And so that comes down from above, and soon they want the, the presses running. They, they want the product uh, being developed, and, and, and they want the workers working on Sunday, which the Bible says is the Lord's Day. But they do not consult the Bible, nor care that, that the Bible says that. And, and so here is the proving ground. And, and it comes to the child of God, to the believer that has a new heart and a new spirit. And in that heart, there's a desire to do the will of God. But, oh, oh, my, this, this is troubling. This is my only source of income. I have a family, I have little children, I have bills to pay, and what am I going to do? Now, now that's real trouble. Daniel and his friends had real trouble also. Greater trouble than uh, losing a job and not being able to pay bills. They would have lost their life if this did not go... Um, the way it did, if God did not work things out in this case, then Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have undoubtedly been executed uh, because the king says that this is the way I want these men to uh, be instructed. This is the food I want them to eat. And we saw, or, or we, we will see later on in the book of Daniel, when the king wants others to do something and they refuse to do it, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will later refuse to bow down to the image the king sets up, that the king reacts furiously and immediately sentences them to death in, in a horrible way by being thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. So we can be sure that this is a matter of life and death concerning whether Daniel and his friends um, uh, eat the king's meat and drink the king's wine or fail to do so. And, and uh, you, you know, uh, it, it's very easy for the people of the world to say no to the child of God, isn't it? it it's very easy. And what typically happens is when the corporation makes changes and says, well, now we want everyone to work on Sunday and everyone has to work on this day, no exceptions. Well, then the true believer goes to his supervisor at, or to his manager and makes request and says, uh, I understand um, that you want everyone to work but is it possible that I can get that day off? I'll work a double some other day. I'll I'll work till midnight on Saturday. I'll come in at midnight um, early Monday morning. I'll do whatever you want. Just is it possible I, I can get that day off? And so he makes request of his supervisor and manager who will then send it up the line to the vice president and, and whoever who will make the final decision. And yet, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat or with the wine which he drank. And that means that, yes, Daniel is making request 
of the Prince of the Eunuchs. He's going to go through proper channels. He's going to uh, present it to man. But before he does that, he's already made up his mind, I cannot and I will not disobey God on this law. I will not. I, I, I cannot uh, do what they want me to do. And so, if it comes to it, I will just refuse to eat the meat and to drink the wine, no matter the consequence, no matter what happens. That's what Daniel purposed in his heart. And, you know, if our heart is wavering, well, then I don't think we have a heart of a child of God. Our minds might waver, our thoughts might waver, but our heart, it, it's either a born-again heart or it's not. And, and, and that's why the emphasis is placed here upon the heart. The heart does not waver. The heart desires to serve God perfectly and will serve God. And, and so, uh, in this case, Daniel, his soul, his spirit, God had given him uh, much grace. And so, his newborn-again spirit had control over his body. The, the, the spirit of Christ indwelling him had authority over the life of Daniel and, and Daniel submitted himself to God in his soul, and, and also he bore rule over his own body, and he did not permit the, uh, the sinful flesh to rule in his life, and that's all by the grace of God. And he did service to God, and he determined to do so. Now, when someone makes request, and Daniel is going to the prince of the eunuchs, he's going to a man. He's already, though, made determination of what he intends to do. But when Daniel goes to the man, we can be sure he first went to God. You know, there's um, another historical record in Nehemiah concerning someone who makes request of a king. It was Nehemiah. And, um, well, let's just read in Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad? seeing thou art not sick, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? There He's asking Nehemiah, what is your request? And Nehemiah is going to make request of the king, just as Daniel made request of the prince of the eunuchs. But notice, at the end of verse 4 of Nehemiah 2, once the king asked, what is your request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And we can be sure that was a quick prayer. It, it, it would have been... Um, instantaneous. Oh God, help me. And then in verse 5, And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And it did please the king. And he did send Nehemiah to the city Jerusalem, and, and we know the, the story. Uh, he built the wall uh, in 52 days. But here, Nehemiah is making requests of the king, but he's also praying to God. 
And that's what the people of God do. We pray to God for God's grace and, and God's help and that God would help us to find uh, favor in the sight of this man as Nehemiah prayed concerning the king. And God, according to his will, grants us grace and favor. And that's certainly what Daniel has been doing. We, we, we know uh, from reading the book of Daniel uh, the type of man he was. And here he's a young man, but still he had that uh, same character and he would have besought the Lord that, that God would have helped him in this situation. But he's going to the prince of the eunuchs, beseeching the prince of the eunuchs. And in that, it's a picture of believers who go to the Lord Jesus Christ. As, as we make request of God to help us in our trials in our troubles, in our tests, and in the tests that God has arranged, the, the circumstances that God has established in our life. And, and we should be sure of that and know that for certain that every test in our life, no matter what it is, has been arranged by God. Every thing that is going on right now currently in your life, in my life, in the life of every child of God, has been set up by God himself. Uh, whether it's a test at work or a test in our home, in marriage, with children, with parents, with neighbors, with strangers, whether it's uh, physical ailments, financial, or whatever kind of test it might be, and there can be a thousand plus of them, God has arranged it. He is the one that has allowed it to happen, and in doing so, he has made the circumstances, and, and we're, we're in this test to see how are we going to respond? Are we going to respond faithfully or unfaithfully? Are we going to pass the test or fail the test? And, you know, life um, at any time is, uh, for the child of God, a test. It, it is a testing ground er, uh, all the days we live. And, of course, when we got into Great Tribulation, it was increased testing doctrinally concerning the things God opened up. And now in the Day of Judgment, there is severe testing, trying to see if we're gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble. But test, test, test are constantly before us. And, and and so the child of God is constantly turning to the Lord for help. Help me, O God. Help me to pass this test. Help me to be faithful and not to give in on the point that I'm being tested on. And, and help me uh, if, let's say, there is a marriage and there's trouble in the marriage and... The world, the doctrine, the, the meat of Babylon, the drink of Babylon would be separate, divorce, get a new wife. And no, for the child of God to be faithful in, in this test, you stay married. You do not contemplate divorce in any way or separation. No, we're, we're joined together by God. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And so we, we turn our eyes to the word of God and, and, and so forth. Just whatever it may be, whatever the test might be, uh, this is how God would have us to respond. Well, uh, now Daniel is making requests to the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. 
and that is our request of the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, help us. Help us to live faithfully and to glorify your name. You know, it's significant in Isaiah 24, that chapter, that uh, it very intensely describes God's judgment on the earth. God's wrath upon the world in verse after verse after verse. And, and then there is a statement made in Isaiah 24, verse 15, that just says a lot to the present situation of each child of God. Wherefore, glorify ye Jehovah in the fires, even the name of Jehovah God of Israel, in the isles of the sea. And this verse is an example of Hebrew parallelism, where God says something in the first part of the verse and restates it in the second part of the verse, but they're, they're both speaking of the same thing. Glorify ye Jehovah in the fires, even the name of Jehovah God of Israel in the isles of the sea. The isles of the sea are the continents, and, and that's the world, because verse after verse in Isaiah 24 has been pointing out the world's on fire. It's judgment day. It's the wrath of God. Remember back in verse 6 of Isaiah 24, it says, Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. So the earth is on fire, the isles of the sea. And and God says there's few men left because the few are the elect left on the earth to live through judgment day, to go through the fire, just as 1 Corinthians chapter 3 points out that God uh, will put the fire to all that profess to be true believers, to, and the day will declare whether they truly are. And, and so here God, in this verse, is speaking to us, and he's telling us it does matter how you live during the day of judgment. And each one of us ought to be seeking to glorify the Lord. Wherefore, glorify ye Jehovah in the fires, in the day of his wrath, in the day of waiting on the Lord, in, in, the, in the time when uh, there's confusion and, and there, there's just no clear direction from time to time as we go through this period, and it's very easy to think, well, the church age is over, the sending forth of the gospel evangelization is done, and what's there left for me to do? Well, what's left for you and for me is to glorify Jehovah, to serve the Lord in these circumstances honorably, faithfully, obediently, and we don't have any doubt about how to do that. That's not the question, is it? The Bible tells us from day to day, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And when we wake up in the day, the Bible guides us, instructs us from step to step on, on what to do to please God in, in our home. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Raise your children well. When we go to work, work heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And love your neighbor. Love your enemies. We, we have direction and guidance for every area of our life in the fires. And when we're obedient and, and when we're doing things God's way, when we're um, observing the Sunday Sabbath, and and for our own good, by the way, and our own benefit, and when 
by the grace of God, were able to keep his commandments more and more in these areas of life, then we will be glorifying the Lord in the fires and not failing the test and not failing uh, to bring him glory in the day of judgment. Well, um, we see that, uh, again, Daniel requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself, and ultimately it is according to the will and grace of God whether we have that kind of heart, whether we have a heart that can be purposed uh, to do the will of God and able to perform the doing of it from the heart. And the only way that's possible is through a newborn again heart. Now look at verse 9 of Daniel 1. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And, you know, once we see the prince of the eunuchs is a type and a figure of the Lord Jesus Christ, then uh, this verse makes perfect sense. It, it fits right in that God brought Daniel. Well, God brought all of his elect into favor and tender love with the prince of life, with the prince of the kings of the earth, with the prince and the savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if it said that, we would, uh, of course, understand it. And But it's only because it says the prince of the eunuchs that it seems unusual. Uh, although we know that historically, and, and it's not only true historically in the Bible, it's true today, that God is able to give his people um, blessing in the sense that as they operate and go about their business in the world and do the things they have to do because we're all part of the world, that God is able to bless his people so that um, they, they can uh, function and not only function, but, but uh, they can uh, function well and, and they can perform well in business or, or they can have um, blessing in their home and, and so forth. Uh, they're able uh, to do well. And how is that when we know that the world is hostile to God and to the people of God? We know there are spiritual forces set against the children of God in the world. And yet the people of God do uh, very well, oftentimes in the world, and it's because that God does grant his people grace and favor, not only in his sight, but in the eyes of men. Now remember that was said of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the young Lord Jesus Christ, the, the, the young boy in Luke chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 49, and he said unto them, how is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Remember that verse, I think it's a proverb, that says, uh, When a man's ways please the, the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. God is able to bless his people, to help his people, to function in the world. And God uh, is already doing it for us. He's already doing it for you and for me, or else uh, we, we would not have made it to this point. God has helped us with jobs. He's helped us in our neighborhoods. He's helped us in many different places in, with many people in various ways. He's helped us with the government as 
uh, he, he tells us that the government is there for our benefit and we're to submit to the government or uh, he's helped us with the authorities and, and so forth in, in our particular nation. And a God helps us with man. And here we are living in uh, a world that is just multiplying evil in, at an incredible rate. And yet we are moving about. And we're going about our business, which should be the Father's business. That is, as we seek to do the will of God day by day. And, and we pray, O oh Lord, uh, guide me in what I should do. And of course, at this time, the Father's business is to feed the sheep. And, 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 and so, um, as believers, uh, God is helping us and, and granting us favor and tender love but we we can't mistake um this language the word favor uh the word favor is strong's number 2617 in the hebrew and it's often translated as mercy in psalm 136 it's the word that's used uh, in verse after verse uh, Psalm 136, verse 1 says, O give thanks unto Jehovah, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. O give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. O give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. And in every verse, uh, the word mercy is this word favor. Translate as favor in our verse. And 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 so uh god brought daniel into mercy mercy and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs now tender love is another word that's also translated as mercy if we go to genesis 43 in genesis 43 verse 14 um it says, and, and this is the account of Joseph, uh, and that's who Jacob is referring to. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Jacob was, was praying to God that God would give mercy in the sight of the man. Now it so happened that that man, that Egyptian Lord was Joseph a type of Christ and and he did find mercy they did find mercy in the sight of that man just as God's people find mercy in the sight of Christ uh, it says uh, also or this word also is translated as mercy in Nehemiah Nehemiah again but this time in chapter 1 and in verse 11 uh, it says O Lord I beseech thee let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper I pray thee thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man for I was the king's cupbearer. And, and this is the word that we have here in Daniel. And it's, it's the word that's translated compassions in that wonderful verse in Lamentations that the Lord's compassions fail not. It, and, and this is what God did for Daniel. God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. God did it. God arranged it in an earthly way, historically, yes. But also, spiritually, God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince and savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It, uh, it uh, fits very well. Okay, um, let's, let's read... Um, in verse 10, And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your face 
your face is worse liking than the children which are of your sort. Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Well, we don't have time to to get into this right now. Only the word, the Hebrew word translated worse liking, is translated as sad in, in another place. And the word translated sort, children which are of your sort, is a very interesting word that's always translated as rejoicing or glad or rejoice. So it's, it, it really, we can understand this for why should he see your faces sad or sadder than the children which are of your rejoicing, the children of your gladness. And, and then that would make him in danger his head to the king. Well, they, we we can understand how the when you look up that word translated as sort that's that's translated glad or rejoicing it always seems to point to uh, those uh, rejoicing in Jacob or uh, rejoicing in Zion that is God's elect and and here it, the the concern is if you do not eat the king's meat. You will be of sad countenance. Just as Nehemiah, by the way, uh, it was noticed he was sad before the king. You, you'll be sad and not rejoicing and not glad. Uh, well, Daniel responds to the prince of the eunuchs by uh, requesting uh, to to prove him. And he says this in verse 11 and 12, Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee ten days, and let, let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Now, what is pulse? What is pulse? Well, we'll, we'll have to uh, wait until the next Bible study, but um, consider that Daniel 1 is focused on the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation, it was during the Great Tribulation that God poured out the latter rain. And unsurprising, really, when we look at the word pulse, we're going to see how it relates to the latter rain, to to God sending forth his word into the world outside the churches. And that's where Daniel and his friends are, spiritually speaking. In Babylon, it's a picture of the world outside the church, which is typified by Judah. And out in the world, there was the latter rain. And, and that uh, will relate to why Daniel is making requests to eat pulse and to drink water. Well, uh, we'll have to save that again for our next study. May the Lord's perfect will be done. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship Sunday Bible Study. For more information or to hear additional Bible studies, be sure to visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com.